going live. Hey, so hi, my name is Sebastian Budgen. I'm a founding member of Historical Materialism Journal and the book series and the conferences, some of which you will already be familiar with. So I want to just to pitch to you the idea of you uh, subscribing to the journal, firstly. The journal comes out four times a year, published by Brill, over a thousand pages of uh, extremely important and stimulating uh, Marxist theory and Marxist history. Um, we have a discount at the moment for individual subscribers around the time of the, the London conference. And we very strongly uh, both request and uh, demand that you subscribe to the journal, that you uh, get other people to subscribe to the journal, and of course that you get uh, your institution, if you're part of a university or other institution, to subscribe to the journal. We need more subscribers for this project to be able to expand and continue. The second thing I really wanted to push was the book series. Uh, the book series you will also probably be familiar with. It's published by Real Academic Press, and then the volumes come out 12 months later with Haymarket Books in Chicago, paperback. Um, we have more than 200 volumes published now, of translations of original work, of document collections, of uh, translations from uh, Marxist theory from across the world, from Japan to uh, uh, China to um, India to Latin America, very important Latin American list shaping up in the book series and so on. Um, it's a really crucial intervention in Marxist uh, literature and in, in making Marxist theory available um, that really hasn't existed on this scale since the 1970s. So we'd like you to look at the book series, buy individual volumes, perhaps take up the offer of the book club that Haymarket is, uh, is, is uh, promoting. And also, of course, if, again, if you're part of an institution, to get your institution to buy as many volumes as possible. Uh, those are the two key elements of our activity, aside from the conferences, the journal and the book series. And we think it would be uh, well, we think it's essential, basically, for us, for our existence, for us to be able to continue to thrive or those to expand. So please, subscribe to the journal, buy the books in the book series, publicize both around you, and help us build historical materials and projects. Hello, everyone. I would like to thank you to, uh, I'd like to welcome you today to this um, round table on recent scholarship on Louis Althusser. Um, my name is Drew Jane. Um, there's an error in the program where it introduces me as a York, as a affiliated at York University, but uh, I'm not, I haven't been in many years, but in the words of um, Etienne Balabar, I'm just a citizen and an activist um, in the city of Toronto. So, and I'm remain a member of the Althusserian current in my endeavors. Um, number two, I would like to quickly, before we start, um, do a quick shout out to a member, another member of the Althusser and current Samuel Mercer and the members of Liverpool Hope UCU for carrying out a successful strike vote. It is always inspiring to see comrades from the Althusser and current at the front lines of struggle today. And I really do hope that we'll be doing a book launch for his um, Althusserian critique of post work when that comes out as part of the HM book series. Now, um, let me quickly go through what is going to be the format for today's roundtable. First of all, we're going to have um, our four presenters um, and four authors um, give 10 minutes each about their recent books, just to introduce them so that just in case all of you have not had a chance 
to be um, to catch up, you have a bit of an understanding of where they're coming from. Then we're going to have one round of questions, and these um, questions have been uh, they've prepared in advance, but they haven't told each other the questions yet. But they've, they've picked each other and who they will be asking a question to. I will be a little bit cheeky, and I may ask a few questions at the end, um, as is my right as the chair, and then we will go forward. So the um, the the order of um, part, um, of presentations will first be William S. Lewis. He is a professor of philosophy at Skidmore College. After that, we will have Stefano Pipa, who is a researcher at the University of um, Milano Bicocca at AM. Then we have Natalia Roma, who is a professor and researcher at Universidad de Buenos Aires. And then um, we have Pani Otis who has a number of different roles, but um, is a member, uh, most importantly for this pre um, presentation, is a member of the editorial board of um, HM and I was a key figure in the HM Greece conference. So, and so I'd like to, and so we, we're, we have a really full stack of people today. Um, uh, to speak about their books. Um, William is uh, the author of Concrete Critical Theory, Althusser's Marxism, which will be coming out next year. So maybe uh, I will turn it over to um, William. Okay, thank you. Uh, hopefully on this sharing screen will go seamlessly as it always does with Zoom. And uh, we'll play this. And Hopefully I'm now, you're now seeing uh, one of two slides. I'm not gonna slide you to death. So, and I'll start my time now. So the t my book, uh, which I just turned in the index for, so it's very close, maybe even uh, uh, Christmas or Hanukkah <laughs> might come out. Uh, it's called Concrete Critical Theory, Althusser's Marxism. I just first wanted to thank very briefly, so we don't take away from uh, ideas that are gonna be shared. Drew for putting this together, Stefano, uh, Natalia, um, and Panayotis, two, three better interlocutors I couldn't imagine. Um, and also just HM for 20 years, which almost coincides with my career in philosophy, is creating an environment for thinking about Marxism rigorously and richly. I, I can't imagine my, I can't imagine what Marxism would be in the 21st century without them, which says a lot. So the book, Concrete Critical Theory, Outsource Marxism, the tiny URL is for those that might have trouble hearing or that English is a second language. If you can type that into yours, you'll, you'll get the text of what I'm going to say. So that might be useful for some of you. So the aims of my book were to construct an Althusserian critical theory and to show its applicability to certain problems in political philosophy and of social life. In terms of its structure, it develops a, a, a distinctly Althusserian critical theory by reconstructing and defending Althusser's scattered work on Leninist concrete analysis, and especially by defending historical materialism as a legitimate social scientific method amongst others. It moves from philosophy of social science to uh, practice and applies this method to class identification formation and stratification, to problems of race and racism, to non-ideal debates in deliberative democracy, and to a critique of political and cultural cosmopolitanism and their ideas of justice. In the time that I have, I'd like to describe the main contours of Althusser's variety of, of critical theory, what I call concrete analysis, and its similarity and dissimilarity from the critical theory most people know, which is Frankfurt School of Critical Theory. What I'm gonna to use to do this is uh, a nice uh, three principles of critical theory that Raymond Guest put together in his 1983 book, I think on Habermas for the most part, the idea of a critical theory. I'm gonna go from three to one and from areas of rough agreement to areas of, uh, I think, dispute or non-agreement where they differ. But because it actually, Althusser's critical theory as I develop it fits all three, I think we can call it broadly a critical theory, just not a Frankfurt School critical theory. And that's what I'll try to put across in three minutes or whatever that I have right now. So the third principle, which Guess argues unites critical theories, is that critical theories differ epistemologically in essential ways from theories in the natural sciences. Theories in natural science are objectifying, critical theories are reflective. 
The main thrust of Althusser's critique of conventional philosophy of natural science is that it is an empiricism. The core belief characterizing empiricism is that the essence of an object can come to be known as it is by a subject. Inasmuch as positivist philosophies of science tend to emphasize the way in which appropriate methods of investigation produce true knowledge of scientific ob objects, Althusser rejects them. Likewise, he crit criticizes idealist and reflective theories, which stress the way subjective factors eventually result in the total understanding of social and natural objects, the Hegelian tradition. So then insofar as a critical theory emphasizes a reflexivity, wherein human subjects come to know their truly human self through critical research, enlightenment, and political action, Althusser would accuse it of empiricism. That said, Althusser does not think that we should accept the results of scientific research unproblematically. Because both science and politics begin from ideological knowledge, he endorses critical self-reflection on a scientific study's presuppositions, methods, and results from a specific class position. Doing so help, will help to purge a study of ideological notions that will improve the chances that acting upon a study's findings will bring success. Therefore, so long as reflexivity is taken broadly to mean a moment in the critical process when engaged inquirers occupying a certain class position scrutinize a science and its objects for ideological notions, then Althusser's critical theory is consonant with the entirety of Guess's third principle. Guess's second principle, its compatibility with Althusser's critical theory is more easily dealt with than the third. This criterion is critical theories have cognitive content, i.e. they are forms of knowledge. Following Marx and Engels, Althusser con conceives of human life as organized around production and reproduction. Rather than excluding intellectual work from other productive practices, Althusser includes it. So then, alongside biological, economic, and political production, Althusser lists three sorts of intellectual production, ideological, scientific, and philosophical. For the same reason he rejects empiricism, he avoids the Cartesian concept of cognition and its representationalist connotations. However, if cognition is understood liberally as the mechanisms by which humans acquire, process, store, and act on information from the environment, then Althusser would agree that concrete analysis produces knowledge. Further, it is the unique combination of scientific and philosophical thinking involved in concrete analysis that produces better practical knowledge than do the ideological truths we find ready to mind. Prima facie, concrete analysis appears to satisfy Guess's first principle. Like Frankfurt School critical studies, the results of concrete analysis as having special standings as guide for human action. Specifically, a group which engages in concrete analysis is more likely to act in such a way that their political goals are realized. That said, this correspondence does not seem sufficient to indicate in accord with the totality of the first thesis. As Guest clarifies under a subheading, critical theories have special standing as guides for human action in that they are aimed at producing enlightenment in the agents who hold them. That is in enabling those agents to determine what their true interests are. And B, they are inherently emancipatory, i.e. they free agents from a kind of coercion. If the conjunction in that, in Guess's um, claim, marks a strong if the conjunction in that marks a strong causal claim, then Althusser would disagree with Guess's two ancillary statements while ag agreeing with the primary criterion. As our analysis of Guess's second criterion has already shown, concrete analysis aims at producing knowledge which is otherwise unavailable and that may guide human action. However, Althusser would not agree that a critical theory helps agents to determine what their true interests are, and for two reasons. First, he thinks that our interests are produced in and through our socioeconomic relations. Althusser does not deem humans to have true interests, which can be determined irrespective of existing and historically contingent relations. Second, the aim of concrete analysis is not to discover our interests, but to understand ourselves and our social relations such that we can alter them. Though they may be somewhat transformed in the course of inquiry, interests proceed and instigate analysis rather than follow from it or are precedent to it. Further, and to address subthesis D of subthesis B of the first element, it is not clear that concrete analyses are inherently emancipatory. 
For one, like any science, the results are fallible. Second, Althusser rejects the idea of alienation re referenced by the phrase, a kind of coercion which is partly self-imposed. Underlying this element is the philosophical anthropology just mentioned. According to this metaphysics, human beings as a species are one individual and this individual's journey to enlightenment and emancipation is history. According to this theory of man, the fact that one portion of humanity now restricts the freedom and steals the labor and potential of another portion reflects an internal contradiction within the development of the human species as a whole. Insofar as alienation is something man does to himself, it is self-imposed. For Althusser, rejecting this anthropology as well as the transcendental normativity associated with it also means denying them the inherently emancipatory and enlightening potential of critical theory as essential elements of Frankfurt School critical thought. This does not mean that concrete analyses are no help to us in comprehending our situations or that they cannot assist us in achieving emancipatory and egalitarian political goals. However, the fruits of a concrete analysis will be judged according to the particular values of those who initiate inquiry into a given conjuncture's transformation. The promise of Althusserian concrete analysis and what makes it a special guide is that it can produce knowledge of how a particular class of people in a particular time, in a particular place is dominated, oppressed, or exploited. Moreover, it can, can suggest pl potential political means for the alleviation of these conditions. Nothing about concrete analysis, however, speaks to or guarantees enlightenment or emancipation. It's my last paragraph. So then these are the main contours of Althusser's practice of concrete analysis as it is developed, defended, and applied over the course of my book, Concrete Critical Theory. First, though it embraces the results of the natural and social sciences, and though it starts from ideological notions, concrete analysis accepts neither of these cognitive forms uncritically. Rather, through a self-consciously reflexive process, inquirers occupying a certain class position engage in the production of knowledge about the historical conjuncture and about the concrete roles they play in it as subjects and agents. Second, concrete analysis produces practical knowledge. That is, when performed well, it permits engaged inquirers to understand how the socioeconomic world works such that they may influence and thereby direct their lives fruitfully, more fruitfully than they would otherwise be able. Finally, concrete analysis is a special guide, but not to emancipation and enlightenment for all of humanity. With no underlying normative notion of what it is to be human or of what humans should become, it cannot be this guide. Beginning from an anti-humanist position, enlightenment and emancipation are always relative and provisional. The judgment that they are achieved is based on the specific valuations of those who posit them and who may feel compelled to initiate critical inquiry into their circumstances. John Dewey puts this point better than Althusser ever did when he wrote in 1935 that, quote, nothing is clearer that the conception of liberty is always relative to forces that at a given time and place are increasingly felt to be oppressive, end quote. Using the term concrete in a way strikingly similar to Althusser's employment of the term in concrete analysis, he adds that, quote, liberty and the concrete signifies release from the impact of particular oppressive forces, emancipation from something once taken as a normal part of human life, but now experienced as bondage. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bill, for that uh, really fascinating presentation. Um, I have a lot of questions. Then um, for Stefano, um, uh, Stefano's new book is, um, when Stefano's book came out, it really stressed me out because I'm writing a book on a similar topic at the exact same time. And um, so the, this book comes out called Althusser and Contingency, which is what, would you like to show the room the book quickly while I, uh, that's the book, I, when I saw it, I was like, oh man, he's beaten me to the punch. And frankly, um, don't tell any book publisher, he has beaten me to the punch. So go and read his book. It is really fascinating on this topic. So please take it, go, take it, Stefano. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew, for the uh, presentation, for your comments. Okay, just want to try myself. Sorry. Okay. So um, this book uh, is um, came out in 2000, uh, 
until a couple of years ago. Uh, this book, uh, the title uh, says it, is concerned uh, with the notion of uh, contingency in, uh, in the entirety of uh, the work of, uh, of Louis Althusser. It is wisely, widely recognized that this notion uh, stands at the center of uh, Althusser's late uh, writings, where he argues uh, for the existence of a completely unknown materialist tradition, which he calls uh, aleatory materialism, or sometimes materialism of the encounter. And as such, uh, the question of the aleatory of chance is mobilized by Althusser in the 80s to criticize the belief uh, for a long time central to orthodox Marxism uh, that history was uh, a process inevitably directed towards a goal, that would be communism, and to reject the presupposition that materialism itself has to do with discovering the laws presiding over the unfolding of, the, uh, of this historical process. But the guiding presumption of my study, uh, which started back then, I, I think some 10 years ago, uh, the guiding presumption was uh, um, it, of the book is that uh, Althusser's engagement with contingency actually cannot be confined only to the last phase of his work, but constitutes uh, uh, instead one of his major and abiding preoccupations. Uh, Althusser draws on the concept and the implications of uh, contingency, or at least grapples with, uh, uh, let's say, uh, let's call it the standpoint of contingency uh, at each stage of his, uh, of his uh, lifelong attempt to reinterpret Marxism and to clarify the philosophical basis that might sustain such reinterpretation. So I think that what I try to, um, to show in, uh, in the book is that Althusser's later writings are at the same time both an innovation with respect to what he attempted to do uh, during the preceding years. And obviously there are uh, shifts, there are breaks and there are many of them, but also uh, they are a reorganization of what was already present as a market tendency in his own earlier work. I must say, uh, on this, that I, I was always struck uh, by, uh, positively struck by a phrase by Warren Montag. Uh, he nicely put it uh, when he said that uh, the publication of the writings of the 80s have the effect uh, of changing what is visible also in the previous phase, making space for a new reading more attentive to the nuances in, in his work. So the thesis that I try uh, to flesh out in the, in the course of this book uh, is that there is no sudden shift between a structure or structuralist Althusser on the one hand and a contingentist Althusser. Rather, uh, we find, I think, uh, in his work, a constant reworking of the relationship between uh, the classical categories of necessity and uh, contingency. And this reworking constitutes, uh, so to speak, the background uh, of the major steps of Althusser's uh, trajectory. Uh, from the attack to the philosophy of history inspired by Hegel already in the late 40s and 50s, uh, uh, to the question then of the dialectics in the 60s, to his theorization of ideology and the subject, uh, uh, to the issue of politics through Machiavelli, and uh, of course, finally, to the idea of an entirely new philosophy for uh, Marxism in, uh, in the 80s. So overall, in this book, uh, um, I tried to trace the progressive elaboration of a problem which uh, emerges and surfaces in different places and uh, in different times in Althusser's writings. There is um, no such a thing as a linearity of his engagement uh, with contingency. And at the same time, uh, I tried to reread some of the much debated issues in Althusser's scholarship based on this uh, ongoing elaboration. And I stress ongoing because uh, I, uh, I tried uh, to uh, refuse, I refused to project the late Althusser back onto the early Althusser, rather uh, attempting to follow, let's say, the intricacies of his confrontation with the issue of contingency throughout the years. Um, the aim of the book, uh, consequently, is, uh, basically, uh, is basically twofold. On the one hand, it seeks to trace the emergence and the progressive elaboration of Althusser's notion of contingency by um, unearthing 
uh, what I call uh, the vocabulary of contingency. And that is uh, the set of notion and terms that are proper to Althusser's investigation of contingency and that Althusser develops in the different phases of his work. And contingency in Althusser has many names, beginning, rupture, encounter, displacement, condensation, taking hold, and these are just some of them. And then, of course, the Klinamen, the Swerve, etc. And they do not appear in his writings at the same time, nor are they always, uh, uh, this must be recognized, they are not always used rigorously. And I tried uh, throughout the book to detail stage by stage the construction, let's say, of this vocabulary. On the other hand, uh, I, tried, uh, um, I tried to bring out uh, the consequences of this presence, of the presence of um, the vocabulary of contingency uh, for some of the most important aspects of his thought, such as uh, his conception of the historical dialectics and uh, his theory of ideology, for example, attempting to show the productivity, let's say, of the standpoint of contingency for a reassessment of these famous concepts. Uh, of course, I don't have the time to go into uh, too much uh, detail uh, here, but I can, uh, I can perhaps uh, um, just mention two theoretical places, let's say, um, where the standpoint of contingency, in my opinion, opens up a productive rereading, or at least, uh, uh, at least for me. Uh, one is uh, uh, the notion of structural causality which I try to interpret um, in chapter two as a sort of elaboration of the expression necessity of contingency on the basis of some evidence already present in uh, reading capital. Uh, so this concept would appear to be responsible according to many uh, interpreters uh, for a necessary inflection of Althusser's Marxism. But things, uh, I try to show that things are not that simple. Hmm? Uh, as it is actually uh, related, in my opinion, to the question of the intertwining in history of uh, contingency and necessity. Uh, the other one that I can mention here is uh, uh, the issue of functionalism in his theory of ideology. If we take the standpoint of contingency and valorize certain observations in Althusser's writings, we can actually argue that uh, his theory of interpolation stands, I think, in a very complex relation to the problem, uh, with the problem of class struggle in the materiality of the apparatuses. But class struggle in turn uh, includes for us uh, uh, a contingent dimension, uh, because uh, as he says, its outcomes are never foreseeable in advance. And that's why I tried to reread Althusser's theory of interpolation as a theory of over-interpolation rooted in the complexity of the materiality of the apparatus and at the same time dominated by the contingent and unforeseeable shifting of class struggle. Uh, let me check the time. Yeah. Uh, I just uh, conclude uh, briefly. Um, so uh, I would say that uh, as the title of the book suggests, uh, this work is not about Althusser's conception of contingency per se. Rather, it is about Althusser and contingency in the sense that it's, it tries to talk about his relationship uh, with uh, uh, this notion. And what constitutes uh, ultimately, for me, the originality of Althusser's philosophy is the fact that uh, he tried um, to establish a new relationship between the two classical modalities that the history of thought normally uh, opposed. Hmm? On the one hand, contingency, on the other hand, uh, necessity. You have this in the history of philosophy. Uh, so uh, they are opposed generally in order to dismiss contingency as uh, uh, the modality of what is merely accidental or unessential. Uh, uh, on the contrary, Althusser proposes to think of history and politics through the inversion of this valorization by asking uh, in an increasingly uh, open uh, manner, what happens if we uh, think the primacy of contingency over necessity? What happens? Uh, to uh, Marxist dialectics? What happens to politics and ideology? Hmm? What happens to materialism? And these are some of the questions that I try to address uh, in the book, taking as a point of departure the idea that uh, his engagement with contingency constitutes uh, a potentially uh, fruitful point of departure for uh, rereading Althusser today. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Stefano, for that wonderful presentation. And we, uh, yeah, we will discuss this. Uh, uh, next, we have uh, Natalia Roma. Um, she will be, her, her latest book is for theory, out of there and politics of time. I have a copy because I'm reviewing it for her. And um, this is a really fascinating book. I, will, I have a question for this one too, but um, I will let her give her presentation about it first. Thank you, Drav. And I'm very happy to be with, with you today. Um, let me... Uh, let me, before I begin, uh, to, to uh, thank uh, everyone here. Um, I'm in, you know, in uh, many a decade ago, we started in Argentina with meetings between small groups of researchers from various South American countries. Uh, we find out that the same was happening simultaneously in Chile and Mexico, uh, and we gathered together year by year. Uh, the meetings became more numerous and extensive. Uh, we have already had uh, nine international meetings, and we have created a Latin American network of Algerian studies, uh, but the, the, this experience uh, already regularly uh, bring together more than 100 colleagues from different countries, Italy, France, uh, US, uh, Brazil, Chile, Argentina, and, and so on. Um, you know, on the occasion of the um, International Colloquium um, at Buenos Aires uh, on the anniversary of Lire de Capital, uh, our dear Warren Montag wondered if we shouldn't think that it was uh, only then that the conditions for the reception of such a powerful and implacable uh, thought as Althusser's seem to arise. Um, we know that uh, on the one hand, the disappearance of Althusser's figure uh, from the field of critical thought uh, was uh, not a product of lethargy or slow oblivion, but uh, the result uh, of a theoretical and strategic struggle uh, and defeat. Uh, Balibar had put it beautifully when he uh, has said that the erasure of the role played by Althusser in Marxist field of the 60s and um, mainly the 70s and 80s uh, is part of a more general censorship of uh, operation, um, as he notes, uh, it is a question of denying, uh, th these are his words, I'm, I'm just paraphrasing and uh, no, not quoting, but, but he said uh, something uh, as a sort of, uh, it is a question of denying that during the 60s and 70s, Marxism was something more than a repetition of, the, of uh, dogmatic formulation. Uh, formulations. Everything happens as if uh, at the highest level, it is only important to make people forget that there was an activity, an intellectual productivity within Marxism, attempts, errors, and not only recitations and illusions. Marxist intellectuals, and above all communists, must at all costs be made to look retrospectively like naive victims or impostors, villains in the service of a vast conspiracy. They must never have been able to think for themselves. Um, as uh, Montag suggested in Buenos Aires in um, 2015, uh, that perhaps uh, were also theoretical reasons that fed a discredit based on a profound misunderstanding. Uh, it seems not only that Althusser's thought was uncomfortable in its polemic and combative side, but, but also in its complexity, uh, in its resistance to any form of simplification or flattening of the reading of history and of the real. Uh, I wonder whether uh, we should not think that a certain process of collective maturity was necessary to arrive until today at the same questions that animated his writing in the 60s. Uh, perhaps Althusser arrived prematurely uh, at his theoretical conjecture. Perhaps today we can see more clearly in his intervention. Uh, 
It took a lot of effort, uh, the work of editing, translating, and pushing and published and overlooked works carried out by persevering researchers and readers, uh, convinced that there is something in these texts that does not yet rest, that calls us from certain anachronism to open a gap in academic common, in academic common sense and in the cliches of left-wing intellectual culture, something that calls us not to produce a self-indulgent thinking that, it, that dispenses us uh, from sharing the sufferings of our peoples. Uh, but, but it also seems to have been necessary for the historical circumstance, circumstance, uh, circumstances uh, that in Althusser were barely an intuition to become a present that appears to us as inexorable. Uh, it is the fragilization of life, the weakening of our joyful passions, and the ferocity of cruel forms of neoliberal subjectivation that call for a theory capable of making thinkable the relation between the great historical processes of capital and effective forms and subjective dispositions into practical and everyday modalities. Uh, it was necessary that Margaret Thatcher said clearly in the 80s that the objective of capital is not the economy but the soul for us to begin to ask ourselves if there was not something substantive in that articulation between Marxism and psychoanalysis that Althusser foresaw as essential in the course of the struggles of the end of the century. Uh, but perhaps it was also necessary that some of the young philosophers who promised the renewal of thought should end up working in the right-wing derivations of the 60s imagination. It was per perhaps necessary that the globalization of the disaster generated by late capitalism reintroduce an unavoidable question about the totality that in the 80s uh, seemed to have become obsolete and, trans and, transcend and, and transcended by over specialized and fragmented interrogations around micro battles. In short, it was necessary um, it was necessary uh, that the question of dialectics appears, uh, uh, appeared one again uh, to take seriously the overdetermined complexity of the conjecture, the plurality of historical time and the unfolding uh, of the diverse registers of theoretical, philosophical and strategic thought in its differential articulation so that our curiosity for Althusser's delicate and dense writing might find uh, the urgency of the questions that the hour demands. Of course, there is no uh, warranty today that we will succeed in formulating a new conjunction between theory and politics. Uh, this does not depend on our love for books or, and concepts. Philosophers are not the ones who make history, <laughs> I'm afraid. <laughs> but uh, we can open up some of the questions that only a few years ago seemed closed. In this sense, there is a thread that runs through the the diversity of the books we present today, and, he, and it is in their polemical disposition, the vocation to open up the theoretical conjecture to reveal what in, what in it sounds hollow. Uh, Sotiris book is a fundamental tool for entering what we might today call the field of Althusserian studies. His book joins systematic works uh, such as Warren Montag's Althusser and his contemporaries and takes up the contributions made by so many in recent decades in order to reconstruct the profound and emporetic connection between philosophy and communism that constitutes one of the ways in which Althusser thought operates uh, as a dialectic dialectical bridge between uh, heterogeneous fields, uh, a, dialectic, uh, a dialectical power whose weakening is part of our current theoretical and political defeats. Uh, Stefano Pipa's Althusserian contingency concentrates on aspects that allow us to understand the singular operation that embodies Althusser's intervention as a sort of hinge between two epochs uh, that seem to have remained completely uh, uncommunicable. Uh, William Lewis' work faces up to a series of indispensable 
tasks in order to approach the ring of Althusserian thought today and succeed in reconstructing another of the broken bridges of our time between theoretical critique and political strategic thought. The main aim uh, of uh, my book is to show that taking up again today some central elements of Althusser thought allow us to return to a turning point in Marxist thought, a moment in which the so-called uh, crisis of Marxism still left open to the question of its future. Uh, I believe that, uh, as Etienne Balivar says in the, that, that brief fragment I, I have closed earlier, uh, that the silencing of Althusser is more than the abandonment of a possible drift uh, of Marxism, uh, of Marxist theory in favor of, uh, of others that are more current or more appropriate for thinking about the present situation. Far from this, his silencing symptomizes a moment of retraction and closure of the possibility opened by the crisis of Marxism. Uh, in a world that was still that of the third world movements, the new left, the national liberation movements, the anti-imperialist struggles and feminism. Uh, today we know in retrospect that this moment was extinguished uh, prematurely under the consolidation of a new historical bloc laid by transnational finance capital and characterized by a profound reconstructing of the world of of the world of work, a crisis of political representations and a cultural collapse of the image of revolution. I believe that this turning point at the dawn of neoliberalism constitutes a place to which we must return in order to rethink the elements that we have lost along the way and without which critical theory is important and political strategy is left without a few future horizon. In this sense, fourth theory is organized into parts. Uh, the first one dedicated to revisiting those developments of, of Althusser and Althusserianism that allow us to identify risks and deviations in diverse perspectives of the current uh, critical field, feminist theory, post-colonial studies, biopolitics, uh, discourse uh, theory. With the aim of thinking about the theoretical conjecture, the book focuses uh, not so much on the life and work of the thinker uh, as uh, on the process without subject of his theoretical problematic, incorporating the readings uh, and contributions of Balibar, Pecheur, uh, Montag, uh, Morfino, feminist uh, theoristicians of the uh, reproduction social theory, uh, the current developments of Latin American Althusserianism, among others. Uh, I was especially uh, interested in reviewing contemporary uses of the Algerian problematic and in showing some idealist tendencies that uh, can be read uh, in the criticism that, uh, criticisms that uh, have been made of his develop, developments uh, from different positions. Uh, in this sense, the book inscripts Algerian in a current dialogue with Shishek, Butler, uh, Laclau, Foucault, uh, Federico, the Risi and others. Uh, my main hypothesis is that abandonment of the Althusserian proposal derives in an impoverishment of the link between totality and case under the form of a new idealist abstractions that are presented as more actual, uh, such as hegemony power discourse. The second part uh, of the book is a more uh, systematic study of how to understand theoretical practice and the relations between science, philosophy, and politics in the strict materialist and dialectical terms that Althusser and his readers construct. The second part called just theory uh, in relation to the first part called conjecture uh, has as its background the consideration of a need to revise what a materialist dialectic can be for the uh, 21st century, understood as a field of contradictory and productive encounters between our love for the true and our desire for historical transformation and social uh, justice. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, um, and then we have uh, Aniotis Sutiris, who is the author of A Philosophy for Communism, Rethinking Althusser, um, which I think was now, you know, when I was studying Althusser in the early 2000s, 
Detour for Theory by Gregory Elliott was sort of the text that you had to refer to. I think that for, the, for a new generation of Althusserians, um, they may not go to, um, they, I think this is the first book they're going to be picking up. And if they can finish this book, they are going to learn, um, be much more educated than I was in the early 2000s as well. <laughs> so Pradyat was taken away. Well, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I mean, uh, one of the questions that everyone who has worked uh, on Alto surfaces is, why are we interested uh, in Althusser? We are talking about a philosopher who was really terrible in his philosophical polemics. He was always ready to, you know, cut corners, uh, you know, use any kinds of attacks. Uh, who would write in a very dogmatic way, who would spend more than a decade, uh, at least the entire 1970s, writing unpublished fantastic manuscripts, uh, which in a certain way, as if in every manuscript he was trying again to write one very big introduction to Marxism and philosophy. In reality, he was expanding, exploring other themes. And at the same time, uh, uh, writing uh, texts that very, were very important, but where they were all, also exercises in very traditional Marxist-Leninist uh, langue de bois, to use the French expression. Uh, you can read, I mean, Le uh, Vache Noir, the, the, the interview is the only unpublished uh, manuscript that has this quality of this kind of certain, who would defend dictatorship of the proletariat, and I agree with that uh, defense, but if you, if you look at the phrasing, it is as, as if it's, why, I mean, it's like a very biblical defense. I mean, we cannot, it's in the Holy Bible, we cannot get these words out. Uh, I mean, at the same time, he was, you know, one of the most open-minded, uh, both in his, in his research, in his dialogue, in, in the books that he uh, that he actually read and underlined, a bill that has worked in the archives, knows it very well. And th there is a list, if anyone is interested, it is, it is available online of Althusser's library, which mentions all the books that he had in his library and also has uh, you know, notes, whether it was read, whether it was underlined, whether it was noted. And, and also, but why, why do we care about someone who would at the same time, for example, engage in a very, very close reading of Gramsci, in the 1970s, and then write a polemic, which in reality is not a polemic against Gramsci, it's a polemic against, uh, you know, a certain version of uh, Eurocommunism. And, 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 and I would say, to answer the question, it's not rhetorical, is we still work on Althusser because more than any other philosopher, he attempted to think what it means to be a communist in philosophy not what it means to be a communist philosopher or a communist theorist, a communist in philosophy, what it means to engage in philosophy and engage in philosophy in a political manner, both the, not just in the traditional sense of the politics of theory, but how this strange and in, a, in certain ways detached, uh, you know, theoretical endeavor with which all of us philosophers, you know, have been entangled or trapped in a, in a in certain way, why this is pertinent to real lives, things happening out there and the class struggle. And I think this, this, this idea is the red thread through his uh, entire work in, in a certain way. I mean, uh, it's a very, he, he, there's always a, a political dimension in Althusser. I think this is what I tried to bring forward uh, in my book, uh, which is exactly, uh, I mean, in, in early Althusser. Why does early Althusser try to uh, reconstruct uh, an idea of a Marxist science uh, uh, devoid of any, you know, teleology or metaphysics and based on on the possibility that a certain philosophical practice can offer guarantees of scientificity, exactly because he thinks, even in a very classical, this is his more classical Marxist or Leninist moment, that good politics, and he was obviously in, in disagreement with the politics of Western Europe, communist reformism of that time needed a, you know, a, a left-wing uh, correction. And he thought that perhaps if we got better theory, this will help. This is what Bill, 
very aptly describes in his book as uh, you know Althusser scientism in a, in a certain positive way. He always had a conception of of science as guiding act. And what is also the guiding thread of Althusser's uh, you know uh, so long uh, self criticism, which is this is also an, an important aspect of the politics of philosophy in Althusser. He, uh, this constant self-criticism even in the sense of bending of the stick to the other side because uh, let's face it it is 1966 most of the non-french speaking world hasn't even had the time to actually read the books that defined the, the early althusserian uh, moment the moment of Lire le capital and pour marx and althusser is already engaging in a very profound uh, self-criticism and correction and even opening up uh, new, new vistas in that direction, which is this, this is by itself, it's a philosophical gesture by itself of, of, of the utmost importance and all, which is also part of my, I try to retrace this in my book, this, this idea, why? Because he, he needs to bring class struggle also back, bring struggle into the, the very notion of structure and have a very confrontational and relational conception of social reality, avoiding any idea of latent structures, which is an important aspect of his self-criticism. Uh, and on the way, he also offers, which I think is, is a very important contribution by itself, uh, a very profound thinking of philosophy. Because Althusser tries to think what it, what it means to philosophize. Philosophy is not a philological exercise. I mean, I, I wouldn't go for a, a nominalist definition of philosophy. Philosophy is everything that people that call themselves philosophers have, uh, uh, you know, engaged or commented upon. No, this is not a definition of. There, there's something, and 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 all the different uh, definitions of philosophy he offers, however schematic they might be, they 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 they, they capture something. They capture the fact that at least if we talk in a line that comes from uh, you know ancient ancient Greek philosophy to you know to, to Western modernity. Uh, at the articulation of class struggle, politics, and science, questions emerge, questions of a very particular discursive uh, form that can only be described as philosophical, but at the same time, they are strongly, and by definition, heterogeneous, that is, they are, they they are indeed class struggle in, in theory. In the last instance, of course, and taking into consideration of many, many meditations, and this is also very, very important, contribution uh, by Alter. And this is also part of a political project, how to think a possible left-wing turn of the communist movement. And this is uh, this is beneath uh, and, and uh, outside of Althusser's own shortcomings. Althusser's tragedies were very, not only, I mean, there's a personal tragedy and it's very important and courageous that Bill Lewis brings this up in the book. Uh, this, is, this is a very important aspect and we shouldn't be so silent about, uh, about, about it, but also all the political tragedies, his inability to think himself outside the party, his inability to think through the consequences of his own, uh, you know, of his own thinking. He thinks radical novelty uh, in, in the book, in the manuscript on Machiavelli, the need for a radically novel form of revolutionary politics and just stays within the Communist Party, the French Communist Party, defending in the way I just des I described earlier, you know, the dictatorship of the proletariat, despite the fact that it's, it was a good defense of the notion of the dictatorship of the proletariat. I, I think so, but I think this, this, this is a common, uh, a, a common thread in Althusser. And the same goes, uh, for the for the very all this really really elaborate confrontation with the question of how to think in a non teleological manner, which I think this it comes out beautifully in Stefano's book book, uh, which offers the I mean uh, one of the most important uh, reconstructions and a full reconstruction of this of, of this entire this uh, trajectory, uh, and which is exactly uh, how to think uh, the very fact that. Communism is the subaltern tendency, is the weak tendency, is the weak force. It's there, it's always open as a possibility, but it's, it, there's nothing, nothing uh, to say that it, it will eventually arrive.
it's very condensed, it's a very open thing. How to think under this, how to think under the very contingency of the encounter, if we, which is the meaning, I think, of the phrase, how to think under uh, the conjecture. And this is a very political thinking. It's not about, you know, uh, sort of uh, uh, diluting or, or undermining the possibility of politics. It's not about randomness. It's not a, it's not a poetics of chance. It's the very idea of how to do politics, uh, because if you are trying to do politics that will bring forward the possibility of ruptures, the possibility of revolutionary events, the possibility of social emancipation, then you need not to think that you are acting as the agent of an historical uh, tendency already there or, or, or some teleology. You need to you know, think of what it means to what is the art of organizing good encounters? I, this is a phrase from uh, Deleuze, from the small Spinoza book by Deleuze, but I think this, this is the, the most beautiful phrase that encapsulates what it means to do communist policy, what it means to work towards an encounter that you do not know when, how, how we will, it will be overdetermined, but at the same time, you do work, you do, you, you're doing politics. Uh, and 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 it, and it's obvious that all this anti-theological thinking is is very 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 rich in 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 the help it can give to people think through political questions. I mean, if you look at the research that Natalia Roma has has been doing for the past years, it's it's very very interesting. It's it's very fascinating. Okay, how exactly this kind of a non-theological materialism of the encounter. You know, combined with a radical theory, Marxist-inspired theory of social reproduction, can indeed, you know, uh, be the base and the starting point of, of, of a new radical uh, feminism. Uh, for me, this is exactly what 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 can explain the appeal of such notions by Althusser. And in in a way, I think uh, that even in, in in the last period, I mean, the last the second part of the 1970s. Uh, it, it's very interesting that Althusser, in his public uh, public statements, is the closest he comes to actually thinking this politics of the encounter. And all, I mean, although, for example, both Poulanges and Balibar at that period offered more complex descriptions of the functioning of, 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 of the bourgeois state than simply saying it is a machine that turns social force into political power and law. At the same time, again, Althusser captured the crucial question of any politics that organizes good encounter. They need to have autonomous organizations of the subaltern classes outside the state and even outside the, the party. And at the same time, the need of the party or whatever the party means as a metonymy to be outside the state exactly because you cannot have the, you cannot, if you want to create the possibilities of the encounters, you need collective, the collective ingenuity, you need, you need spaces for experimentation, you need initiatives from below. So I think and I think this was uh, it was exactly. And to to conclude, well, uh, I think this is this is still the pertinence of Althusser today. Uh, it's still why we can still go back and reread him, perhaps in different ways than how he was read in the 1960s or 1970s. But facing the, the questions that we're facing, facing the deep uh, continuing crisis of the revolutionary mo movement, and facing at the same time the need for radical novelty and new encounters between theories, politics, collective practices, and movements, well, uh, it's still really good to continue you know, reading and writing about Althusser. And well, I think that we can still continue this discussion in many, many, HM conference to come. Thank you, Baniotis, for that. Um, Baniotis, you are the first. So now we'll just do a quick round of questions and then we will then see what goes on in the chat. Um, so, Baniotis, I think you have the first question and I think it's to Bill. Well, uh, it's a very simple question, actually, because as I was reading your book and I, I came across this phrase, the normative uh, in, in some place. And I, I mean, I was thinking, okay, I, I, the third part of my book poses the question, is it possible, is an Althusserian politics possible in a similar way that Althusser posed the question whether a Hegelian politics is possible? But the question I would like to pose you, 
Is an Althusserian ethics possible? Is it, I mean, I, 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 and to not to put it in such a, a general way, I mean, you always refer to Dewey and you had a very particular pragmatic or practice better oriented conception of ethics instead of a, you know, abstract normative conception. But I was wondering if we can reconstruct this normative or post-normative ethical aspect also from Althusser and his conception of materialism. Thanks. Um, I, I, I think that allows me to build exactly on what I started with a bit, that the normative construction um, conception that guides Frankfurt School of critical theory, and I think this is being challenged a lot by people like Amy Allen and Rahel Yegi more lately, but this idea that um, there's an idea of, of non-alienation, emancipation, right? That, that just doesn't exist in Althusser. You get rid of the teleology, you get rid of the species being, the early Marx kind of thing. You don't have this kind of guiding transcendental normative notion, even if it's the process at the, at the end of history through self-discovery. So the question has to be, if this normativity or an Althusserian ethic exists, is it... Um, where where is it to be found? And there's clearly, and I think this is something that you also see in Marx, um, there is a great kind of sympathy and outrage with the, with the oppressed, um, an outrage about exploitation, a way of describing it literarily so that you understand it. And this has led some people to say, oh yeah, Marx was a humanist. Yes, there's a Kantian ethic in there. James Ferner has kind of been getting into this kind of, uh, thing. Um, but I also think at the same time that if you look at Marx as being a critique of moral theory and of transcendental moral theories, and Althusser is a critique of transcendental moral theories, you can't have that. This the, the, the way in which we think of human beings and what's good in ways in which we should act towards one another is going to be created in order to allow the mode of production, it's the product of the social relations that we have there. So the transcendental ethic is, is not there. But the Dewey aspect of it, Dewey wrestles with the same thing. He says, okay, he's read Hegel, he's written his dissertation on Hegel, um, but he thinks that in a democratic society, there's not this idea of the good, which is waiting there at the end, that's gonna be realized in the right political system. But there are many competing ideas of the good. Um, so you've got this vast pluralism with Dewey, with Althusser locating, he locates ideas of the good as being class values. And so the values that you see that if one is feeling oppressed and exploited as a class, and part of the book is I go into that the notion of class needs to be reconstructed here, but these are imminent particular values of feelings of unfreedom, feelings of exploitation expression. They might be gender-based, they might be race-based, they might be class-based, they might be mixtures of all three of these kinds of things. Um, and so they will be there. Um, and when they're realized, when you realize it's a better situation, this will also be a particular judgment that that ideal has been realized. So I don't think that there is an, Althusser articulates an ethics, but I also think that there would be the way for describing an ethics in a particular situation. And that would look differently in 1960 than it does in 2020. Thanks. Blue, would you like to ask a question of Stefano? I would love to. So I sent this earlier and I probably should have because it's better to get things, <laughs> but hopefully you didn't have too much time to think about it. So this is gonna be a question that's for Stefano. It might also be for everybody because I think everybody um, in the presentation mentioned the materialist dialectic. I noticed them avoiding uh, saying the word dialectical materialism. Um, so it seems like everybody who talked except for me wants to um, retain the dialectic in some ways. And this is more particular for Stefano. Um, this focus on contingency, um, it seems to, and it's quite clear that you say that the idea of the interpenetration of opposites, that the beginning of, beginning of a term necessitates its end as well. Uh, one of these dialectical laws that Engels formulates, Plekhanov, et cetera, that's abandoned with contingency and the emphasis on it. 
the idea, like Lefebvre, I just taught historical materialism or dialectical materialism. He says the main term is the becoming. You also reject that or say that Althusser rejects that. Um, but what I saw preserved there, I thought, is the idea of qualitative leaps, uh, that in a certain conjuncture, there's a related set of historical, historical tendencies that when they're augmented or come to ripening or something like that, can lead to rapid transformation into a different state, into a different regime. Um, so it seemed to me that you're going to preserve out of the dialectic the law of quantity into quality, to say it in very Marxist-Leninist terms. And I was wondering if your focus on contingency, um, although it gets rid of a lot of the other two dialectical laws, if we're going to formulate them in the ABCs of Marxism, does it preserve that one? <clears throat> Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for your question, your uh, very uh, elaborated question and, and a difficult one. I do think that, uh, in a sense, uh, obviously, there, uh, Althusser in the 60s uh, is uh, uh, clearly arguing against uh, the idea of a gradual transformation of quantity and into quality. So, in this sense, uh, that, that's, that's, uh, that's there. So, I think. Uh, um, we, we all agree uh, with that, but at the same time, he's retaining the idea that a qualitative leaps uh, mean uh, rapid transformation, except that uh, transformation is not the outcome of a simple linear accumulation of factors. Uh, so if you want, uh, I think that uh, he's challenging the idea of a gradual transformation, but it's still uh, thinking in the 60s in contradiction of determination and uh, in, in, for Marx, uh, that uh, um, quality, qualitative uh, leaps is a, a, an idea that sort of must be retained and reworked uh, in a different vocabulary. So um, I think, I don't think that at that point in the 60s, uh, Althusser is um, getting rid of the idea of quality, quantity and quality, except that this transformation takes place on the basis of a completely different uh, historical dynamics. I think that in some, um, I don't know if uh, texts are available in English, but certainly it is, uh, uh, they are uh, available in French uh, in uh, some lectures on Rousseau from 66. He seems so immediately after the publication of Reading Capital, I think, uh, he talks about uh, uh, what seems to be his idea of structural causality, saying that also in Rousseau, you can find, uh, especially in his second discourse, you can find uh, this idea that there are laws mm, presiding over certain uh, epochs, which means uh, certain modes of production, but you cannot find the law of the transformation of one uh, mode of production to another. And Rousseau, um, Rousseau uh, clarifies that this is a contingent moment. And I think that there he also uses the idea of a, a quality and a quantity and saying this, this idea can challenge the linear transformation. And we have a sort of anticipation in Rousseau of linear transformation, which seems to me to suggest that in the end, that the say is using this uh, uh, framework, uh, trying to rearrange terms and see, uh, trying to say, uh, do we have other concepts that uh, uh, can enable us to think what is, after all, uh, essential for politics. That this this transformation of one structure into another, uh, which was thought according to the concept of quantity and quality, and perhaps should be reformulated. So this this is what uh, I think uh, I can say about uh, about this. Great, thank you for that, Stefano. And could you um, ask a question of Natalia, please? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so. One second, that I get to it, uh, Natalia. And in, in your in your book, uh, you engage uh, with a rereading of, uh, among other things, you engage uh, with a rereading of Althusser's theory of ideology and its interpolation, emphasizing uh, very strongly the importance of uh, taking into account class struggle. Uh, from this perspective, uh, you also criticize uh, Zizek's reading of Althusser's thesis. And uh, I think uh, very rightly, you showed that uh, what remains unthought in uh, Zizek's perspective, uh, in general, but more especially, in particular, I think in the sublime object of ideology, is precisely the role of conflict and uh, 
uh, struggle. And I couldn't agree um, more uh, with, uh, with you on this. And uh, um, especially when you argue that the Althusserian theory is not a, th a theory of the full efficacy of the symbolic. And that for Althusser, and I quote from your book, state power is not a unidirectional phenomenon but uh, is based on a complex symbolic imaginary and affective play of transference and uh, also counter transference. Um, so my, my question, uh, I agree with your perspective. I think you put it very uh, forcefully and nicely. And um, my question would be, is there in your opinion a, role, a definite role that is played by Spinoza's, uh, Spinoza's concept of imaginary in the rejection, in um, Althusser's rejection of the full efficacy of the symbolic. And is the notion of the symbolic ultimately still uh, appropriate for capturing uh, the relationship in Althusser between ideology and uh, class struggle? Well, thank you very much. Uh, this, uh, the answer uh, should take many hours. So <laughs> I, I, I'm not going to answer it properly. Um, but thank you. Uh, no, I, 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 I would say that I believe that the difference between Althusser and Shishek uh, with respect to the notion of interpolation and, and, and the reading of Lacan uh, uh, that, that it entails uh, that not have to do with the absence of one uh, of its dimensions uh, in the Althusserian reading. Um, it is not so much that there is in Althusser an overdimension of symbolic materiality, uh, as a different way of understanding the, the relation between the symbolic, the imaginary, and the real. Uh, I believe that in Shishek, uh, at time, sometimes the real appears uh, at the truth of the ideological and the political. Uh, certain expressions, for example, in which the real is presented uh, as a nucleus, uh, uh, or, or, uh, or, or, or an ultimate rock. Um, uh, in, in, in Althusser, there is an, an emphasis on the, on the, um, uh, on the decalage, on, on the misadjust or dislocate articulation between registers, uh, precisely because the, there the, the Spinozian reference organizes the problem in such a way that we can think uh, of uh, heterogeneous materialities articulated and, uh, uh, and, and misadjust. Um, there, there you can find, uh, as, as, um, as um, Montag has pointed out, and, and also Peche, uh, um, uh, materiality of the imaginary. But, but I, I, I also would say that um, there is a, a kind of um, materiality of the real, of the real in a, a in a rigorous uh, Lacanian sense. Um, as for the real in Althusser, uh, it appears to be approached more in terms of uh, an ambivalence, uh, an affective and transferential dimension that, that constitutes the fragile aspect of domination. Um, in addition to fulfilling the, the function of affective attachment that uh, Shishek uh, attributes to it. Um, for example, in, in, in books, uh, uh, in, 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 in this uh, uh, writing uh, called uh, Kefer, uh, there he, he performs a, a conception of state power um, where the, the affective uh, uh, attachment, where, where the affective um, uh, contradictory relation, uh, he calls it uh, transference and counter transference. Uh, there is a, an another. Um, uh, posthumous um, writing, but, but very, very ironic, very, very funny indeed, um, which was um, in French, it was in the psychoanalysis écrit, uh, or écrit en, en psychoanalysis, um, where, where he, he makes uh, jokes with, with a, uh, he said, for, for example, uh, things, uh, uh, Quoting uh, uh, 
uh, apo apocryphally, uh, for example, Machiavelli and, and saying where, uh, uh, such as Machiavelli has said, every um, contra-revolution is uh, also a revolution. Uh, and such as uh, Freud has said, every uh, counter-transference is uh, also a, a transference. Well, I think that in that joke, uh, he touches something of the, of the, um, I, I'm I'm uh, I'm thinking aloud, but um, you can you can think that there is something like um, a kind of um, well contingency, of course, a, 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 a consumption a, a conception of con contingency as a, a, a very minimal vibration, which has its opportunity in the structure. Um, you can read also the the the, the concept the the, the so-called um, aleatory materialism in such a way that you can find that contingency is uh, already determined. Uh, uh, so I think that it, it is very interesting to 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 go again to reread the 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 Lacanian three registers in this way, where the Kalash. Uh, plays a, a, a very important role. Uh, so, uh, therefore, perhaps uh, you can you can arrive to uh, uh, Lacanian materialism. Uh, I think that, uh, for example, Peixeira's late writings uh, go in that direction, uh, which is not a, a mere philosophical aim. It's also a political question. Um, how can you um, how can you uh, find the minimal uh, political um, difference when the political forms, the political um, uh, forms of organizations that, that, that we can imagine are already in a crisis. Where is the minimum uh, political uh, force in, 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 in every structure, in every um, net of power relations. Uh, well, I, I think that, that there's a path that, that should be uh, performed and that, that should be uh, uh, questioned, but, but there's something there. And I found that okay. perhaps, uh, sorry, Shishek uh, closed uh, very early that, that possibility. Thank you for that. Um, Natalia, would you like to ask Spaniotis uh, um, a question? You're on mute, sorry. Ah, yes, yes. I have a question for uh, Panikiotis, sorry. Um, it is just to, to share um, uh, perhaps a, um, a consideration about um, current conjecture and, and especially pandemic conjecture, where it seems that um, that it had uh, brought back a, a kind of uh, humanist tendencies to lefty uh, leftist culture or leftist uh, thinking. So, so um, in your work, uh, Panagiotis, uh, you make a reconstruction of the political thought in Althusser's uh, uh, thinking or in Althusser's uh, writings. Uh, and there is still a tension between theoretical anti-humanism uh, anti and the notion of strategy. So I wonder uh, if, if you would think that uh, in, is there a current productivity of this crossover? Um, how can we uh, uh, consider, how can we think about uh, strategic intervention uh, still uh, persevering in a, in a rigorous anti-humanist uh, perspective? Well, uh, well, that's a good question. Well, I think that in a certain way, uh, Althusser's theoretical anti-humanism anti and what this entails in terms of politics, namely a politics that puts class struggle at the center, that look that uh, that by denying any common human essence or substance, uh, you know, opens up uh, the potential for new social uh, configurations and new relations. 
instead of the teleology inherent in any sense of theoretical humanism, I think still more, more pertinent. And, uh, you know, in a certain way, when Althusser was attacking theoretical humanism and also a kind of humanist Marxism, uh, the conjecture was also that there were some common elements. Uh, we they did not have climate change or they did not face pandemics, but for example, there was nuclear annihilation as a possibility. And the, and the idea, if you look at the discourse of the official communist movement of that period, the idea that we're, humanity is facing the same problems and we're all parts of the same humanity, et cetera, et cetera, uh, which is also uh, <clears throat> part of the Soviet rhetoric after the 20th uh, uh, Congress uh, of, the Soviet, of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. So th there are some analogies. So the idea that let's not let's leave humanity aside as a common substance or a common telos or a common you know uh, something that is a, a common driving force in history uh, was at that time important to insist no what we're dealing is class societies we're dealing with societies that are traversed by radical difference and not just by radical difference but also by radical antagonism and whatever possibility by itself contingent in the sense we describe, not chance, but contingent in the sense of non being predetermined and non being teleological. It depends exactly of how uh, this kind of class antagonism is played out. And the best thing we do is exactly uh, to, 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 instead of choosing a, a, a unitary con conception that we are all part of this, we are all on the same boat. No, we need to be as much uh, you know, um, antagonistic and scissionist as possible. That, you know, class struggle happens even within the same boat. <laughs> They're all in, in the same way. I think this was the spirit of Althusser, it, and it was really a very radical spirit. So uh, it's not about, of course, it's not about practical humanism. It's not about, you know, everyday gestures of solidarity in contrast, uh, Althus, uh, in contrast, all this, are, are part of, of, a sub, of subaltern antagonistic practices and subaltern ethos, an ethos of solidarity, an ethos of helping each other, et cetera, et cetera. But at, at the same time, there is class struggle. And, and let's face it, uh, we're talking about climate change. Okay, climate change in a technical way affects the entirety of humanity, <laughs> since we're all living on the same planet. At the same time, you can already see post-apocalyptic you know, sci-fi movies suggesting that, well, the rich might even find a way of li uh, living this planet, <laughs> uh, you know, saving themselves in the end. So, I, I mean, uh, and at the same time, we know that climate change is deeply conditioned uh, by, by capitalism. It's deeply conditioned by productive relations, by, uh, by social relations, beginning with, with, the, with the, the domination of fossil capital and how it emerged, et cetera, et cetera. And, and the only way to actually fight back climate change is by means of fighting back capitalism, by exactly by means bringing forward class antagonism and class struggle and organizing, uh, you know, collective uh, collective struggle. Uh, uh, and in this sense, I think that well, it's we cannot so easily, uh, you know, uh, say that. Uh, so I think that in this sense, theoretical anti-humanism as a, as a position that you know really strength stresses social antagonism and the need to avoid any any conception of a common you know common historical uh, transcendental dynamic in a certain way is it's much more uh, it's really really pertinent and useful today and we really need to be good theoretical anti-humanist if we really want to be in a practical manner you know good to uh, people who with whom the, we share the same condition of oppression uh, subalternity and possible climate change or pandemic annihilation. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and if I just add something more, both, both the pandemic and, it's a big discussion, but I'll just say it in a dogmatic way, uh, both the pandemic and climate change require the emergence of new social forms. This is, a, this is a very open question in the history of Marxism. Even in the critique of the, of the, of the, of the, prog of the Gotha program, Marx has an one liner. This will be decided scientifically. Scientifically means experiment. So the only way to have new forms, new social forms to emerge is exactly to liberate the potential for new encounters. To liberate, uh, uh, and in, in, in this way, this is not unethical, perhaps. If we speak about what is the practical philosophy of, the, of such an Althusserian 
uh, theoretical anti-humanism is exactly the idea that instead of thinking a, a grand scheme or a grand narrative for humanity, we need to think of how to liberate the potential of, of new social forms exactly in the sense of new uh, encounters, trying to see which new encounters can last. The lasting encounters that perhaps are our only uh, solution and savior against you know, uh, all the dangers, all the grave dangers uh, entailed in contemporary capitalism. So thank you everyone for your first round of questions. So now I'm gonna, um, for your first round, and now I'm gonna ask us two questions from the um, audience, and then I've got, I'm gonna throw in one or two questions as well. So one, the first question is from Andrea Cevetic. Um, are we idealistic tools and fools? Are social forces always organized by professionals for professionals? What is a hit from below? And I think that's that, you know, that's a fair enough question. I think that one can, uh, I mean, Bill, Bill has mentioned the importance of biography in his own work. And, you know, one cannot take away from the fact that Althusser was a professor and he was, you know, he was taught. And so I think that that's an important question. And then the second one, and I think this is a, an interesting question is from Marcello Novello. How come Althusser's concrete political analysis Example, Peronism as fascism, Togliati's line on unions as explanation for PCI post 45 success, PCF role in May 68, Portuguese revolution. And then he asks or later, later about Stalinism and how to deal with the deviations of Stalinism and the Second International. Why are his concrete political analyses so flawed? Right? Well, I mean, and I think that, you know, this is, um, Paniotas mentioned this too, some of the blinkers on Althusser's thought. Uh, we've been talking um, about him so importantly being a thinker of concrete conjunctures, yet his solutions to the concrete conjunctures thrown up in front of him, his answers may, do they lack, do they lack something? Um, I then have a, one or two questions. One is for Bill, and I think it's for all of you. If Althusser's thought is a critical theory, and is related to a conjuncture, and it's not a normative process, then why talk about Althusser as Marxism? Insofar that, it seems to me that Marxism arises with a certain um, class conjuncture of the late 19th century. How does one discuss, for example, the 15th century in Italy, Florence? What does one have, when, when Althusser is talking about it, is that still a Marxism? And also the question there for myself is an Althusser in ethics, is, is it a form of effective truth, which is given up by a conjuncture? So there's not a normative ethics, but there is a particular ethics. Um, for Stefano, my question is about contingency versus chance. Um, it seems to me that the problem with Althusser often is that he falls into a kind of contingent notion, which is almost chance-based. And, um, and the Pierre Raymond has criticized Althusser for not being attentive enough to the problem of probability. And there are moments in the late writings where Althusser completely diminishes the importance of virtue, which in my, one way of reading it is skill. So if you're going to have a good encounter, as Paniotis always says, it seems to me that the virtue of the actor is kind of important so that you don't keep throwing up bad dice. And so the, as I think the question then is, does Althusser actually fall into a kind of chance-based notion where he doesn't understand probability sufficiently? And then for Natalie, Natalia, I have a question about Ernesto Leclerc, because it seems to me that the figure, um, the big figure of Althusserianism and post-Althusserianism in the 1970s was good old Ernesto. And, I, and I, what I was wondering is how does that 19, late 1970s conjuncture in Argentina around his work, and he's still, from what I understand, quite influential in Argentinian politics today, his thought. How does that become a way of, um, the kind of um, displacement of Althusser from the political theoretical terrain? Ernesto Leclerc's influence and in thought, how does it, how is that contributed to this displacement of Althusser in Latin America and Latin American thought? So um, maybe do more, I'll start with Bill since you, and then we'll go to uh, Stefano, Natari, and then Paniotis, and then we will close. Thank you, I'll be so brief. There's just a lot of ideas which are hard to not address them all. Um, but I, I think I'll start with the ones from, uh, from the, the web. Um, I don't know if I can address the idealistic tools and fools. Um, 
social forces are organized by, I think, I think that they are exist. I think that they're studied by professionals. So we sometimes can bring attention to them through analysis. Um, but I, I, I can't say much more about that. I can say a little bit more about the Stalinism and about the flawed political analyses. Um, so I, I was trained in history of philosophy in the context. I think if you um, look at the French political situation about the things that Althusser was reading, L'Humanité every day and stuff like that, you can make sense of almost every political analysis that he, that he, that he took a position on. And those look flawed often from what becomes whatever the left consensus on what it should be, that Peronism was a much richer uh, movement, um, that uh, there was something to do with the PCI that Althusser didn't get. And so, yeah, I think in retrospect, um, you can look and you can criticize those, but you can also understand them contextually. Uh, should his, what he said for, in terms of understanding the conjuncture, and I, this is a big part of my book, is building up what a concrete analysis should be. Should he have done much more? Yeah, he's always encouraging other people to do it. Um, and um, to quote Balibar, uh, sans jamais le fournir, without ever furnishing it. So yes, he should have done better and he could have been better if he was better informed instead of cloistered um, in reading history of philosophy. And then Drew's question for me, um, yeah, so I, I'm not, I actually want to say that the core of critical theory should be um, historical materialism, that all history is a history of class struggle. I don't think there's a lot of history of trying to figure out what that means and Engels' root with dialectical laws uh, and then Lenin and Stalin putting these as, as, as metaphysical laws. I think that was a detour. And so I want to correct and say, how do we take this seriously? I don't think it's the only motor of history or the only way of understanding history of the present day. I'm a pluralist. I think that methodological individualist studies, I think methodological holist, um, I think feminist analyses, I think indigenous analyses, all these of our social structure are necessary for understanding it. But I think preserving that there is a way of understanding um, socioeconomic forces by dint of um, them being the result of class struggles is a useful mode of analysis for understanding and changing the world. And that's the Marxism that I think is in critical theory and which I think should be preserved while jettisoning the idea of an end of alienation. I think we're not gonna end that. Thanks. Great, thanks. Um, Stefano. Yes, uh, okay, I will start uh, from, um, from the question that you asked me, um, whether Althusser uh, fell in the end into a chance-based uh, notion of uh, contingency. Um, so, uh, because he did not consider probability, uh, I think that uh, if you look at the very uh, late writings, especially uh, the writings from the 80s, some of them do display uh, a, a tendency to go uh, towards a sort of a concept of a miracle, an event as a miracle. There is this risk. In some texts, it is, it is there, I would say, not in all of them. Um, and uh, so, as always, I think Althusser theorized that there are always two tendencies in philosophy. One is more materialist, the other is more uh, idealist. And, I, and this applies to Althusser himself. And I think that then uh, when we have, uh, when we uh, look at, at his concept of uh, aleatory, for example, uh, it must be distinguished in a sense, or in a way, from the idea of encounter. Uh, aleatory is a term that comes um, comes up later uh, in Althusser's uh, vocabulary of contingency, whereas encounter is already there uh, much uh, earlier. So I do think that, uh, the, for example, through Machiavelli and his engagement with Machiavelli, um, aleatory, um, the word aleatory was added later when he revised the drafts and the drafts, uh, the first draft of his course on Machiavelli dates from 72, I think, of the second engagement because um, before there was uh, also in 62 a brief course on Machiavelli. So let's say that uh, if you look at, uh, at Machiavelli and us uh, and the changes that he uh, makes to the text, 
you can also detect this shift sometimes towards uh, aleatory and uh, you can connect this tendency to some very, very late writings like 86, where I think I just, uh, is exaggerating perhaps this uh, um, notion of chance. And I think uh, we must recognize that. Uh, but on, at the same time, the idea of encounter is not the same as aleatory miracle and uh, uh, total uh, contingency in the sense of uh, unpredictability. I do think that, uh, it, as far as I know, it doesn't engage with the theory of probability. And um, that was probably not his concern. Maybe uh, it could have. Um, but um, yeah, in the end, it didn't. So I think it is something uh, that he's uh, giving uh, to us um, as a task, perhaps. To, uh, but I, I, I do agree with you that sometimes uh, in fact, you can see that he's exaggerating the notion of pure, pure chance. Uh, but I do think also that we should distinguish, for example, his engagement with Machiavelli as a political materialism of the encounter and uh, the aleatory in a miracle-like miracle uh, uh, sense that uh, is, uh, comes up much later. Um, okay, I think I shouldn't uh, uh, really uh, take much longer because there are other questions, so I will uh, get back to you. Thank you for your question. Natalia, and then Paniotis, and then I, there's one more question. I, maybe I'll ask it quickly right now, just because I, I don't think we're going to have time to return to it. So let me just see if Natalia and Paniotis would like to also add the, the question is added, which is how has Althusser's notion of base and superstructure evolved in the context of settler colonialism? Example, the Americas were theoretically virgin prior to settler colonialism's arrival. So, so how does a post-colonial engagement with Althusser, uh, 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 what, do, what are the theoretical resources that we may have to re-examine in Althusser from a post-colonial Althusserian perspective or indigenous uh, Althusserian, uh, Althusserian perspective? Well, sh should I go? Yeah, okay. Uh, well, uh, first to, to, to the question, to Laclos question, uh, I believe that um, this question deserves a, a study of reception because Laclos gravitation has not been homogeneous or similar in the different countries of Latin America. But uh, I, I think that in the case of Argentina, especially, it has been interesting to think about some aspects of the emergence of Peronism in the 40s. Uh, and that's all. <laughs> um, then there was, uh, there has been a, a somewhat late appropriation that, that I think is both interesting and problematic. Uh, problematic, um, I'm thinking about uh, hegemony and, and socialist strategy, for example. Um, it's problematic um, be, because with the intention of, of overcoming a concept of ideology by that of discourse, uh, more is lost than gain. Uh, defect uh, is a conception of politics that is uh, in reality a conception of the ideological struggle it, uh, presented as politics as a whole, which loses uh, the plural temporality as a fundamental element of the conception of a conjecture. Uh, in this sense, like loose operation is abstract and impoverished a temporal complexity. In a sense, this also happens with Butler, for example, in the 90s, with Butler's uh, reading of Althusser's interpolation, for example. Uh, cent uh, so, so I think that a certain discursivism contributes interesting elements to think the signifying dim dimension of historical processes. But it's abstract when it becomes a, a new theory of totality. There's a kind of uh, a hypothesis hypostatic, uh, should I say like that, uh, hypertrophy of, of, of some, af uh, some aspect of, of social processes, and then a, a kind of metaphysical operation. No? This, this happens with political ontologies, for example, uh, or, or somehow post-foundationalist post uh, philosophies. Uh, and, and saying this um, to, to the last question, I, I think that uh, the the uh, Althusserian concept of historical time, of, of plural temporality, of differential temporality uh, must, uh, must be uh, studied deeply. And there is a very interesting uh, theory of imperialism there, uh, both perhaps in, in, in the book uh, Sur la Reproduction, uh, that, uh, that, that, that would contribute uh, many, many interesting elements to the, to the 
uh, schematizing of uh, colonialism to the problem of um, original accumulation to the problem of a decentered uh, uh, topic uh, to think that the, the question uh, that, that, that um, uh, Latin American Marxism and post-colonialism poses to Marxist thinking. Uh, so uh, I think it, it, there, there is a, a path to, to that, that must be um, studied. Thank you for that. And Paniotis, and then I will have the last word and we will call it a day. Okay, uh, in, in regards to the question uh, of, of whether people are uh, idealistic tools organized by professionals, I think that one of the aspects that uh, were important in Althusser's evolution is that a greater apprehension of, of the importance of, let's say, the subaltern ideological uh, practices. This is something Especially, you can see it in texts like the, uh, the the note on the ideological apparatus of the state, a text from the 1970s. So, the importance of class struggle even in ideology and what uh, the collective aspirations and uh, you know uh, are, are the, so he's not. And uh, although, to be fair, Althusser poses a crucial question, which is how do we how do we get bad subjects? subjects that uh, undermine the very process of interpolation. He doesn't ex expand much for that, but this also has to do with the tentative character of his text, but at least he poses the question. So this is an open question. In regards to Althusser's politics, uh, Althusser, Althusser comes from a very particular milieu of the French communist uh, movement, Western European, and, and with all the limitations. Sometimes he's really able to understand, uh, and there's always a, a uh, decalage under his pronounced political positions and his actual criticism. We know from the letters that he, in, in this, from the second uh, half of the 1960s, he thinks that uh, the official communist parties are right wing, revisionist, reformist. He, he uses very harsh words and they think that they are uh, beyond salvage. Uh, it's another thing whether he can actually uh, imagine himself outside of this, of this context, which is also part of his personal, uh, personal tragedy because. This is, was the only world where he could feel safe in a, in a certain way. This, this, this combination of the Ecole Normale Supérieure and the French Communist uh, and the French Communist Party. But this is another story. Um, and, and of course, he was really overdetermined sometimes in the wrong way uh, by, by the very, very particular conjunctural dynamics. For example, part of the problem uh, with uh, his, in his relations to Gramsci, with whom he, he Althusser was really fascinated by Gramsci, and his reading of Machiavelli is very similar to the one done by, at least in, the, in some crucial questions. This is, this is no doubt. At the same time, uh, Althusser always thinks the, that Italian tendencies in the Western Europe communist movement of the 1960s and 1970s are right wing tendencies, uh, which was not, not, not actually very wrong, although things were more, more complex. So, so he projects immediate conjectural intra-party, intra-left dynamics upon theory. Uh, this, this was on a, one of the you know, self-destructive self aspects of, of Althusser's writings in certain instances. So, uh, but I think that, uh, I mean, yeah, he, he was not, but he was mainly a philosopher. So what is interesting is exactly how he brings forward, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> I suppose it's tendencies and dynamics not. And it's true, and a final point. Well, uh, I think that Stefano put it exactly. Th th there is a difference between the encounter and the aleatory, and you can see it both as a trajectory moving from the uh, a materialism of the encounter towards an aleatory materialism, but you can also see it as, as, as tension. The text on Machiavelli with the additions made is exactly uh, the terrain of this uh, tension. Why? Well, this is, this is how Althusser experienced the very defeat of, of the communist movement. We, we have to bear this in mind. We, we, we're talking about the generation of thinkers who really thought that they were part of a giant worldwide movement. This is, this is an existential experience, as a sense of belonging, that it is much beyond uh, our our comprehension at this time. I mean, we might say, for example, persons of my generation might say, yes, we were part of the anti-global movement and you had the sense of community or the anti-war movement. You cannot compare the sense of belonging of someone 
uh, who could say, I belong to something happening and deals with millions and billions, actually, to be more precise. So, so when this all this falls apart with the, appreh with the app apprehension of, of, of how tragic is the situation in the Soviet Union, the defeat of the Cultural Revolution and the defeat of, of Europe, communism, even left Eurocommunism in the 1970s, when all this ha happened at the same time, this, this, is, this is something that for us to say is a, is a very tragic appreciation. And, and one way to respond perhaps to this tragedy is to move from the encounter and the art of organizing the encounter towards a certain uh, conception of chance. You can see there is a poetic of, of chance political gestures. You can see that in, in phrases. It, it, this is undeniable, especially in the 1980s. But at the same time, you can reconstruct the need for a communist virtue. I think that this is still, and this is still the task facing us ahead, and perhaps the most important uh, legacy uh, of Althusser, how to think in a materialist way, a communist virtue, the art of organizing encounters towards communism. That is a wonderful way to, um end this um, uh, this um, round table. I would like to thank all of the speakers. I would like to thank uh, the historical materialism for organizing this conference where, you know, I, I think I should end with, with saying I first met Paniotis Bill um, 13 years ago at a historical materialism conference. I was a young um, a graduate student at that time, kind of interested in this French guy. No one um, wanted to teach it to me. And it was people like Bill and Paniotis and the um, space that was given by historical materialism where I was developed. And so I would like to thank them. I would like to thank you all for your books. And what I would like to also say is that there are young scholars in universities across North America, Europe, um, Latin America, I India, who are studying Althusser fresh for the first time. And they don't aren't stuck with our prejudices. They aren't stuck with our um, but they are being, but they are um, being nourished by the books that the four of the panelists today and others are producing. So um, I encourage you all to study our Kaiman. He is always worth learning from, and then, but we also have to be go beyond him because he was of a certain time as well. And but we always realize that he always grips us. Thank you. Have a good evening, everyone.